Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, thank you very much. Do keep that page in the Bible open if you don't have it in front of you. Uh, as a reminder, it's page 1,218. It's a lot of pages, isn't it? 1,218, uh, right near the back of the Bible. Uh, let me say a prayer as we begin. Uh, Jesus said, anyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house upon the rock. So, Father God, we pray that we would not only... Hear your word this evening, but know what it means to put it into practice. For we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, as was alluded to earlier, um, I'm, I'm a vicar. I'm from the countryside. Why I've had uh, four services already darting between my little country uh, churches. So it's actually very exciting to be here uh, in the big city as I, as I drove in. Uh, I was amazed to see that there was a green grocer's shop with all the vegetables out still open. Sort of uh, six o'clock on a Sunday evening. You don't get that and the countryside. The countryside is a, is a very strange place, really, and lots of strange things uh, happen uh, in the countryside, sometimes quite sort of strange and, and sinister things, actually, uh, in the countryside. Uh, in the village where I live, a village called uh, Brandscourt, there is a, there's a sinister group that has been meeting for about 200 years in an old building on the edge um, of the village. It's a very strange uh, gathering of people, actually. People of all sorts of ages get together. It's about once a week uh, that they meet, so people even bring their children uh, to this gathering. It, it's, it's quite sickening, uh, really. I'm trying to imagine what it's like when they meet together. It's a bit like uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. They gather together and they, they chant things. They say the same thing all at the same time, and it's really, really, uh, really, really odd. And, uh, and I'm having some countries have kind of wised up to uh, groups like this. Uh, some countries have, in fact, banned them, made it illegal, uh, for them to meet uh, together. In our country, there's a strange kind of conspiracy of silence about groups uh, like this one in, in Branscore. Every time the media mentions them, it's kind of to say, well, it's a problem, we know it's a problem, but it's, it's kind of disappearing, and, and one day it'll, it'll be gone, so don't worry too much about it, is what the media says. Uh, but that's, that's not true, is it? That's a fantasy. It's a very strange, very strange group of people. Uh, the, the meetings, they're, they're secret. Uh, you would never know who goes to them. In fact, the chances are you'd never ever be invited to one. You might meet a, a friend and they wouldn't say that they're uh, a member. Maybe some of your closest friends are in fact members. That's how deep it goes. Uh, well, I wonder if you recognize the description. Is it, of course, uh, a local church? My uh, local church that meets in an old building on the edge of town and does things to, to everybody else seems really, really uh, weird. The local church is a very, very strange uh, thing. So here's the question. Why is the local church so odd? Why is the local church so 
so strange and so, so different from the culture uh, around us. You know, lots of people are really quite scared of, of local churches. They approach local churches with uh, great caution, much as like one would a- approach a helicopter, terrified of getting caught up uh, in the rotors. That's a joke. Oh, never mind. You'll get it eventually. That's cool. Why is the local church uh, so strange? Well, there's no other group in my village where people of all sorts of different ages and backgrounds uh, meet together. That's rather odd, uh, isn't it, if you compare it to any other group, like the WI or the Horticultural Society or something like that. They're just for one type of person, uh, it would seem. And yet, in the local church, uh, Corbynistas sitting next to Ukippers, um, Cream First and Jam First, Scone Aficionados uh, sit next to each other quite uh, happily teetotalers and party goers in the same pew. That's strange enough, isn't it? And yet, the local church also makes huge universal claims about itself that it's the place where you can find life, eternal life. That seems strange as well. Why is the local church so, so very odd? Wouldn't it be better if the local church was just a bit less Weird. Perhaps we could try and make local churches a bit less uh, weird. Perhaps we could try and change them so it didn't upset people uh, in the same way. Perhaps it would be better to maybe step away from the local church. It seems strange. It seems odd to our non-Christian friends. So maybe it would be easier if we just walked uh, away. Maybe only come uh, occasionally. Wouldn't it be better if life gets hard for following Jesus Christ to disassociate completely with the local church. Well, those are temptations that face the first people to hear the words of our Bible reading uh, today from 1 Peter, a letter by the apostle of Jesus Christ to churches in a whole variety of of locations. You can see them listed at the beginning uh, of the letter if you just turn back uh, a page. These are places in modern day Turkey, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And these uh, people are united in all their different places by a common experience of feeling very strange, very, very odd in the world around them. They're aliens and strangers looked on with contempt and great curiosity by the world around them. And this letter tells Christians in that situation, maybe Christians in our situation, if you'd call yourself a Christian here, Uh, tonight tells us why we should stick with the local church why the local church is the greatest thing going on anywhere in the world today and Peter tells us throughout his book that the church is spectacular but strange that the church is the most glorious most exciting thing that God is doing in the world uh, today if you were to ask God what is he doing uh, in the world today but he's growing local churches, many of which seem very uninteresting, but that's what God is busy doing today. That's his spectacular work. The local church is spectacular, but strange. In our reading today, we're going to see that that is true, and it's true because Jesus is spectacular, but strange. That's the two headlines there. Uh, The church is spectacular, but strange, because Jesus Christ is spectacular, uh, but strange. Well, if one Peter was like a uh, a car owner's uh, manual with all sorts of different pages about you know, changing the windscreen wiper, washer stuff, and things like that. Well, this passage in 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 uh, to 10, and particularly verses 4 to 10, would be like the part of the manual that tells you how the engine works. You know, this is the driving force, the theoretical beating heart uh, of the letter. And other parts tell us how... The church being spectacular but strange plays out in different parts of uh, life, like uh, family life, being uh, obedient and good uh, citizens by being good uh, workers, by being a good witness to those uh, around us. That's all unpacked in the rest of the letter, but it flows out of this theoretical beating heart of the letter that we're going to look at uh, now. If you just look down with me to page 1,218 again, uh, let's just explain how how it all fits together before we uh, dive in. the big chapter two there, uh, the first couple of, first three verses are a sort of uh, invitation or instruction about what to do with the theory we're just about to 
uh, here. We'll look at that. We'll look at that last. Um, there's a little paragraph starting with uh, verse 4, going on to uh, verse 6. That part there is really about uh, the church and what God is doing in calling the church uh, together. And from verse 6 uh, down to the end of verse 8 is a collection of three quotations Uh, from prophetic parts of the Old Testament. And those parts are all about uh, Jesus Christ. That's where we see that uh, Jesus Christ is spectacular uh, but strange. And verse 9 on to verse 10 again is about uh, the church and the glory of the church. That's how it sort of fits together. The church then is spectacular but strange. Look at some of the claims that Peter makes uh, about the church. As you come to him, says verse 4, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And look down with me to verse 9 again. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who calls you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you are not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Uh, To those poor Christians who are struggling to fit in with the pagan society uh, around them, Peter tells them uh, that the church is spectacular, that they are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people uniquely belonging to God. Uh, To really understand uh, what Peter's saying here, it's really helpful to uh, look at a passage of the Old Testament that Peter has in mind when he says uh, these words. You could turn with me if you like, uh, if you want to keep a finger in there, to page uh, 77. This is the book of Exodus. Page 77. I'm looking at Exodus 19 uh, here. You might know that Exodus chapter 20 is the part of Exodus which has the Ten Commandments and the, and the giving of the law. So at this point in chapter 19, um, Moses has led God's people out of Egypt towards the Promised Land. And here is the moment that Israel is being called to be God's people. The covenant, the special promise relationship between God and his people is being established at this point. And it says here, chapter 19, verse 3, page 77... Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you're to say to the house of Jacob, and what you're to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, You will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. These are the words that Peter has in mind when he reminds the church of how spectacular they are in God's eyes. You are the chosen people today, the royal priesthood. You are the holy nation, the people belonging to God. The whole world belongs to him. You are precious in his eyes. You're his peculiar people his people to stand out and declare his praises in the world your God's holy nation his royal priesthood and the purpose of you being a, a priest part of that priesthood is to proclaim the goodness of God declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous like that is the spectacular calling of the local church, the priestly people of God. Why does God choose uh, Israel in Exodus 19? Well, it's to proclaim his glory to every nation, nation upon earth. Why does he choose the local church today? It's to proclaim his glory to every nation upon earth. This is the greatest show uh, going. Forget uh, Zac Efron and the greatest show. I mean, if you possibly could forget that uh, for a moment, because the local church is much more exciting. So you and I, what is our role? Well, we are here to present God 
to the world, a part of his holy nation, his royal priesthood. Uh, that means that people will make up their minds about Jesus Christ on the basis of what they see uh, about us. It's a bit like um, you know, when you're at school, if you can remember that, that far back. Some of you, it's further back than others, I guess. Uh, and you've got your school uniform, and there's a whole list of things you're not allowed to do wearing your school uniform, well, a lot of things you're not allowed to do uh, with your uh, school uniform. So you're not allowed to be seen wearing your school uniform, for example, uh, picking your nose, enjoying a nice maxillofacial morsel, or nasal nuggets. You can't be seen uh, doing that, uh, can you, in your school uniform. Uh, you, you can't be seen uh, smoking, as cool as that uh, is uh, as well. You can't be uh, seen uh, uh, drinking white lightning, on a park bench, as sensible as that is, obviously the cheapest place, cheapest way to buy alcohol, and you don't have to pay to, uh, to drink it there uh, either. You can't be seen uh, wearing a, a, a skirt that's no more than a belt, as fantastically effective as that is for uh, winding up uh, parents. There are certain things that you can't do with your school uniform. Why? Because when people look at you in your school uniform, they don't just think of you as an individual. Uh, they think of the school you represent. Well, if you're known as a Christian, you're part of the royal priesthood. When people look at your deeds, your behavior, your, your words, they're looking at you decked out in the finery of that priesthood, uh, working out whether Jesus Christ is worth taking seriously because of your life. The church is spectacular, but called to, called to stand out, called to be different, called not to fit in. Peter says, live such good lives amongst the pagans that they see your good works. This is the life of the church, to be spectacular but strange, standing out in the world. So what does this mean uh, for us? Well, don't be tempted to think too little of the local church. It doesn't seem very exciting sometimes, uh, does it? The same uh, few people, sometimes they're not very exciting uh, people, but that doesn't mean that the church isn't exciting. That doesn't mean that the local church isn't the main thing that God is doing in this place. Don't think too little of the church. It, it might be embarrassing sometimes, but in God's eyes, the local church is way more exciting than the greengrocers being open at six o'clock in the evening or anything else that's going on in Westbourne. I'm sure there's some very exciting things happening in Westbourne, but none nearly as exciting as what God is doing here. Don't try and de-strange the church. God wants the church to be spectacular but strange. He wants us to stand out as priests in the world. Let's not try and dumb that down by trying to make the church less embarrassing, less out of step, out of sync with the rest of society. If we do that, we're meddling with the DNA of the church. The church is spectacular but strange. But why would you want to be spectacular if it means that you've got to be strange as well? Well, the church is spectacular, but strange, because Jesus Christ himself is spectacular, but strange. We're a holy priesthood, a temple being built, living stones on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Verse 4 again. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to those who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. The church is spectacular, but strange because Jesus Christ himself is spectacular but strange. That's what those three quotations from the Old Testament, from Isaiah and Psalm 118, tell us about Jesus Christ as they uh, predict hundreds of years beforehand who the Messiah uh, will be. 
He'll be chosen and precious. A, a cornerstone, I don't know if anyone's a, a builder here, but Bob the Builder will be delighted uh, with these passages. Really easy for him to, to understand. Um, the cornerstone from which the whole house uh, is built without it. There's no structural integrity for the building at all. And so it's easy to say that the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Jesus Christ, the giver of life, the only one we truly need to have life in all its fullness, the one who puts their trust in him will never be put to shame, the Bible promises us. He's become the capstone. Again, another building uh, image. Think of those lovely arches. Have we got any in, in here? I suppose this one's probably a bit like it. But that stone in the middle, without which the whole thing will, will fall down. It'll be a major insurance claim, which will be a big bother for the treasurer where he, wherever he's gone. That capstone is essential. Without it, the whole thing falls down. Jesus Christ is spectacular, but strange. He's the only one we truly need uh, for life. And so we ignore him at our peril. Those who disobey the message were destined to do so, Peter says. Jesus Christ is spectacular. And yet at the same time, he is he's strange. He's the stone that the builders overlooked. They walked past it and said, that's no good. We don't need that. And the great irony, of course, is he was the one everyone needed. For a thousand years, uh, some stones, like unattended, some ruins uh, near Athens in Greece. They've been ignored year after year. Um, I guess what happens in, in Greece is when something becomes uh, ruined, people uh, go and raid it for stone to sort of fix up their homes. But, but these particular stones, um, looters had looked at them time and again and thought, well, that's no good. It's can't really fix my house uh, with that. Because these stones looked rather strange. They were kind of shaped like animals and things like that, and chariots and spears and stuff like that. That's what these stones look like. And I guess people trying to fix up their house couldn't really see that, um, uh, you know, holding up the fireplace or anything uh, like that. So it was seen as uh, not valuable, worthy of being overlooked, until a Scottish traveller came by one day, a chap called Thomas uh, Bruce, Lord Elgin, noticed these uh, stones and saw at once what no one had seen for a thousand years, that those stones were immeasurably precious. He brought them back to uh, Scotland, and you can see them today uh, in the British Museum. Uh, stones that for such a long time went ignored and unnoticed. Well, you might know that now they're subject of a major international uh, controversy and ownership disputes. The Greeks want them back and would love to see them mounted up high uh, in glory on the Acropolis uh, again. These are the Elgin marbles. Jesus Christ, in the same way these Bible passages tell us, is so easily overlooked, like the stone the builders rejected, and yet he is the only one of true importance please don't make the same mistake that the builders made don't neglect that stone the one who's really precious the one we need to have for life jesus christ is spectacular but strange a stumbling block easily ignored uh, by many i remember um I've had many, many uh, cycle rides. I'm still recovering at the moment from a, um, from a bike accident I had a, had a while ago, and I've damaged my Achilles tendon. Uh, it doesn't stop me. I still get back on my, on my bike. Um, and if you've ever been to the Wessex Gospel Partnership talks, uh, you know that I always cycle uh, to come here to do those talks. Um, I can still remember my first ever bike crash. I was riding my uh, BMX down a country lane you near know, where I grew up and chatting with a friend next to me, and there in front of me was a huge bit of flint uh, like this, and I went straight over it and lost loads of, the, loads of the skin on my hands and knees and everything like that. So obviously, I survived and got back on my, on my bike, but it was a not a very nice experience. I think I was young enough to still cry when that happened, which was a bit embarrassing in front of my, in front of my friend. It's a great picture, though. That stain that causes uh, the people to stumble is an image of Jesus Christ, who is spectacular, but strange enough to many to cause great offense, to cause stumbling. While some people will, will see the glory of Jesus Christ, many won't. 
Many will just take offense at him. Jesus' first words in his public ministry were repent and believe the good news. In other words, turn away from your, your wickedness. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from living as though you are God in God's world. Turn away from your sin. And that message today still hardens hearts and causes people to stumble. Jesus Christ is spectacular but strange. Why is it that the church struggles uh, to fit in? And that the more faithful we are to God's word, the harder we might find that is because Jesus Christ himself was spectacular but strange. So what do we do uh, with that? Well, let's rejoice when we feel most, uh, most strange, most alienated from the rest of uh, society. Let's rejoice that we're sharing the strangeness of Jesus Christ. Let's rejoice that we're living out our calling to be the priestly people of God, being spectacular but strange. Let's not give in to the temptation to, to de-strange Jesus, to try and kind of step away from bits about Jesus that we find so offensive or so hard to reconcile with modern points, points of view. Uh, it's fair to say that Christians over the years have, have, have tried to do that, to try and fit Jesus in uh, with whatever their latest uh, thinking is. Uh, and then a surprise that this artificial Jesus attracts uh, nobody because he's not real. He's a fantasy. Jesus stripped away from the offense that he causes is not the real Jesus. The real Jesus who calls us to repent and believe the good news, who calls us to have life. The church of God is spectacular but strange. Let's rejoice in that. It's spectacular but strange because Jesus Christ himself is spectacular but strange. So hear the words of the invitation Peter gives to us in verse 1 there. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. Let's grow up. Let's taste more of Jesus Christ and his church. Let's rid ourselves of the things that are so out of place in the church of God, but so, uh, so welcome in the world around us, deceit, hypocrisy, and slander of every kind. And let's embrace the spectacular nature of the local church. Let's rejoice in it and rejoice when we suffer for the name of Christ. Just some words from a, a, a hymn I love as we finish, uh, reminding us of how God sees the church. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. In love he came and sought her to be his holy bride. And with his own blood he bought her. And for her life he died. Amen.